What do the parables of labor tell us about Jesus? That's what we're going to find out in Matthew 19. All right. So now Jesus is starting to get closer and closer to his last mission in Jerusalem. We are on the final steps of his time on earth and soon we'll be going into Jerusalem. He decided to leave the Galilee area and went beyond the Jordan, to the east of the Jordan, which was still considered part of Israel and part of tribal lands of Israel. And the crowd followed him. They are following him everywhere. I mean, honestly, if you saw a guy healing people and making miracles and raising the dead, wouldn't you follow him? So I get it. But he kept going. And the Pharisees, the Pharisees were there too. And they tested him. Hey, is it okay for a man to divorce for any cause? And Jesus comes back and said, you were made male and female. Man should leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. They become one flesh. They are no longer two. So what therefore man is joined together, no one is supposed to separate that. Okay, then. Why did Moses allow a certificate of divorce so that you could send her away? So this was a bit of a trap because the Pharisees had gone away from this rule. There were two schools of thought, one that was more like what Jesus is about to say and one that got very liberal about divorce. And there were all sorts of really horrible phrases about, oh, if you have a wife and she's not the greatest wife, it's like a terrible thing in your whole existence. The Pharisees were divorcing their own wives and helping other people divorce their wives for any reason. And you have to understand at that time, women couldn't own property usually. And so you were condemning her unless she could get remarried to either poverty prostitution. There weren't that many occupations that women did. So it put them in a terrible situation. And then he says, well, that was because you all, not you all, because they weren't alive then, but the people then were hard of heart. Again, that sun either melts you or it hardens you. And in this case, it was hardening people. So he allowed people to divorce for committing adultery and sexual immorality. That was it. It wasn't for any reason. So they were exaggerating exactly what it was. And Jesus was picking one of the two schools of thought on divorce. The disciples said, well, if that's the case, maybe we shouldn't even get married at all. And he said, you know, not everyone can do that. Some people are good with not getting married. There are people who are born that way. There are people who are made eunuchs throughout their lives. And there's people who are made eunuchs by themselves. If you're able to, fine, do that. But if you're not, he's saying, Marriage is not a burden or marriage is not a negative thing if you're not one of these people who can do that. I will tell you, I'm single. I wouldn't have dreamed this for myself. I imagined I was going to get married, potentially have kids, and it just didn't work out for me. And now that I am single, I do see that I have opportunities to spend time doing more things on my own, you know, like this podcast, because I have the time to do it. I don't have the family and the spouse. So I think. Marriage is wonderful. I would still like to get married someday, but I also understand that by being single, this is a gift of ministry too. This is a gift for me to spend time doing the things that God would want me to do. And I hope that the podcast, Small Steps with God, and this one are those things. Now Jesus comes and talks about the children. And so the children brought to them, you know, as the crowd is following him around, I'm sure a lot of people brought all sorts of family members, not only to be healed, but to see Jesus. I mean, this is going to be a miracle that they are going to remember their whole lives. And he says, let the children come to me. Don't hinder them in any way because they are also part of the kingdom of heaven. He laid his hands on them and went away. So he cares for them just like he cares for us and every other human being. This again was a countercultural move. The Romans would put children out to die in the woods if they didn't want the children. When I was in Ashkelon as part of my dig, we found a Roman bathhouse and it, this is the sad and gory part of it, it had hundreds if not thousands of dead baby bodies in the steam bath area. So no one knows why, but it was assumed that these were discarded children from the prostitutes who were in the bath. The Romans, the Greeks did not cherish children unless you were looking for an heir for your kingdom. But for the most part, children weren't considered valuable. The Jewish faith 
has much more of a an eye on families. And so this was revolutionary in the time. And the fact that he says, don't keep children from me, bring them to me, was amazing. It's also why some denominations do child baptism. There's no reason not to give children this gift. Other denominations feel it's something that you have to decide as a conscious behavior. I'm not going to get into the debate, but it's over this passage where a lot of people say, see, child baptism isn't wrong. And now we're confronted again with one more person who comes seeking out Jesus. And he comes to him and says, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Well, we already know that you can't do good deeds to earn eternal life. That's why Jesus is coming. And this is what is about to be exposed, is how you reach eternal life. And he says, why are you asking me about good things? There's only one who is good, for to God, which he's God. Then he says, if you want to enter life, be among the living instead of the dying, like we who sin does, keep the commandments. And then the rich ruler's like, well, which one? And then Jesus comes back, he talks about primarily the ones that have to do with treating other people. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie or bear false witness, honor your mother and father, and love your neighbor as yourself. These are the commandments. And the young man's like, I totally do all those things. That's exactly what I do. I've kept every one of them. Well, first of all, not true because nobody keeps all of them. What do I still lack? So he says, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then follow me. There comes the follow me again. But Jesus is doing that thing again where he says that one sentence because he knows our heart that couldn't be agreed upon. You know, the one man, he says, you know, if you follow me, you won't have a home. You won't have a place to sleep at night. We will travel from place to place. That one guy who said he wanted to bury his father, we don't even know if his father was dead. Maybe his father wasn't even dead yet. But instead, he wanted to spend time doing something else and then come later. Jesus knows that one thing. And in this case of the rich ruler, he is saying, I know the one thing that you won't give up because of me. And when the man heard it, he went away sorrowful, a very mournful system. He just wasn't sorry. He was deeply troubled by this. And Jesus says that it is difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. The biggest thing that probably people in that era understood as a living creature and the smallest thing. And it's not impossible, but it's very difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And when the disciples heard that, he said, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus came back to them and said, with man, this is impossible. But for God, all things are possible. They can be saved because of what God does. And then Peter noticed, he says, we left everything. I mean, Peter had a wife. We've left everything and followed you. What will we have? I and mean, we weren't rich people. And he says, in this new world where the son of man will be on the throne, you will also have 12 thrones and you will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Brought it up before. Were there 12 of them selected because there were 12 tribes of Israel? Here he's saying, yes. Everyone who leaves their house, their mothers, their family in his name, and even the children, which he loves, the land, their stuff for him will receive hundredfold of inheritance in eternal life. And we're going to talk about this in the next chapter. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. I'm sure this probably weighed on the apostles. We're going to find out how in the next chapter. So again, we are coming close to the end of Jerusalem. And my meditation for all of this is, again, about the rich man. I think compared to standards then, we are all very rich, particularly you live in the United States, you live in certain areas, wealthy compared to what people were living then. And now we have to think, am I doing things that are making it hard for me in the kingdom of heaven, like the camel going through the eye of the needle, then remembering that it is Jesus where nothing is impossible? My prayer for this time is that I get rid of those things that prevent me from following Jesus because in my head I have that one thing, or maybe I have many things, that if Jesus were here standing in front of me and he would say, give up this, give up your computers and come follow me. What would, what would it be? And so I'm going to have to pray about that. And the part that I want to share 
is the part where marriage was meant to be forever, that people were meant to be bound together. And when you have that kind of binding, which is why I never got married, I think, is first of all, you have to pick better because this is meant to be forever. So it causes you to be much more detailed in who you pick. But it also means that this person is with you in thick and thin, bad times and good. And when you see things, you know, particularly like um, Hollywood romances where People will get separated and the one will dump all over their ex or tell all their secrets or sing songs about them. This was not the way it was meant to be. It was meant to be that people were bound together, could have trust and faith. And I think that is the intention of marriage. And that is what I want to share with other people is how God meant us to be in this type of binding together until the very end. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can subscribe to the podcast. I'm on Spotify, all the services that use the Apple feed. And if you're interested, you can go to the site, The Bible in Small Steps, and see what the links are to subscribe to podcasts. You can even tell the A lady, you know, the Amazon lady, to play my podcast, and and she will. So whatever way you like to listen to the podcast, you can even do so on the website in case you don't have a podcaster choice, or you know someone who doesn't have a podcaster app. And thank you all for listening.